Welcome to the Got Academy podcast. If you're catching this on YouTube, be sure to check out the podcast on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify for exclusive podcast content. Roads. Where we're going, we don't need roads. It's going airborne. Well, we used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. Hello, Woodhead. Hey, Gil. Hey, how are you doing? I'm great. How are you? So happy to have you here again on the Got Academy podcast. Last time we did history in movies. We talked about ancient Greece. Now we want to talk about science in movies. We want to talk about the evolution of the ape man or the ape man. And this is exactly up your alley. You are an evolutionary biologist. And I'm also a man. (laughs) Incredible. This is why I was looking so hard for an evolutionary biologist who is also male. Please tell me, what is the ratio of males and females in that profession? Uh, well, maybe I should have maybe I should have said human. That's that's of ah. course what I actually meant. Uh, in general, in biology, we're not doing too too badly. It's about fifty fifty gender ratio. Boom! Very nice, very nice. So we picked three movies, and the movies that we picked for this podcast are one two thousand and one Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, very fa- very famous movie, Planet of the Apes, even famouser with Charlton Heston and uh, directed by apparently Franklin Schaffner. And the third one, lesser known, Altered States with William Hurt. I guess just to uh, round things out, I uh, also watched uh, Planet of the Apes 2 Mm. with uh, Mark Wahlberg, uh, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. We all remember, of course. And we have our bonus movie. Ooh, so we're going to do bonus content for our patrons. So Planet of the Apes 2 is just to kind of expand the Planet of the Apes canon a little bit more. They had three so also don't... with Jordan Heston. Maybe. Yeah, there's, there's a ton. Okay. Uh, but this was the first sort of reboot. I also have a bonus movie, which is something else. Are we revealing that or is that a surprise for the patrons? No, no, let's reveal it so so they know, so they have a reason to go for it. So uh, my bonus movie is a movie called Iceman, which is from 1984. And it is a movie which can actually be watched for free on YouTube. So that's nice. Okay. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. I, in, in some ways, it's maybe the most realistic of all the movies. Uh, and I thought it was fun. Okay. My, the movie that I picked, you can also watch it for free if you download it on uTorrent, which I do not recommend. Of course, nobody does that. Nobody does that. Uh, I bought a DVD from uh, Blockbuster. Uh, Me too. For all the movies, I actually ordered the DVDs from Amazon. From Amazon, yes. And yeah. mine is The Crudes. Have you seen The Crudes? Oh, <laughs> I think I have. It's an animation movie. The right? animation movie. There is also some, some interesting uh, notions there about evolution that I would like to discuss. We're going to throw that uh, up on Patreon. Patreon.com slash God Academy for the patrons. So let's, talk, let's go back to the th- three movies. 2001 Space Time Odyssey, Planet of the Apes, the original one from 1968, and Alter States. For me, there were two main recurring themes. The first one is that it's actually right up my alley, something that I feel strongly about, that unchecked science could be dangerous, could be dangerous to humans. We need to regulate science. We need Trump to decide what you guys can explore uh. and find out. Mr. Trump, if you're listening. <laughs> no. And the second one, so uh, we're going to elaborate on that. Of course, uh, this was uh, tongue in cheek. Uh, the second theme is that humans are dangerous. It goes along with the first theme. Because humans are dangerous, you cannot trust humans. Humans do things that are against our interests as a species. We can see that today with climate change and a bunch of other stuff, not only personal. And uh, we can see in all these movies that humans doing science stuff without, uh, with no balance, 
there are bad results. I agree with you on the um, the uh, aggression part and mm-hmm. sort of the ominous side to us. Mm-hmm. I have uh, two additional uh, themes to contribute. One of them is that we are generally talking about sort of ascent, so kind of this idea of growing from what lay lay persons would call lower life forms, which I don't necessarily agree with, and then rising Ah. up to sort of the human level and maybe beyond. So there's sort of this ascent Mm -hmm. and regression also comes, comes back. And another theme, or not really a theme, but kind of a trope that um, is actually in all of the movies, and it, it kind of goes like this. So the different hominids, or the sort of, you know, cavemen, humans, apes, and so on, mm-hmm. there's quite a long distance in time between them, right? Just in evolutionary time. Right. So all the movies kind of need a plot device to uh, cross that distance. So, for example... There needs to be some sort of inner journey, which is like through drugs and some weird, you know, it's not really explained, right. but somehow we can cross the millions of years in that way. Right. In a tank, in or a water they, tank. <laughs> right, in the water tank, or through some sort of travel that involves these monoliths, or some sort of space storm, or like some deus ex machina needs to happen so that we can span these ages. Right. In the premise, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, right. it's, it's. I don't know if that's necessarily a theme, but it's. I. It. Uh, I. It was noticeable that there was kind of a plot device that they all needed. Right. How else could you do it? So the thing actually about evolution in general is that usually it's not actually an ascent and a descent up and down. Mm-hmm. It's a branching pattern, right? Oh. So, for example. If we want to compare us to apes, well, we can just look at apes right now. They're just on a different branch and we exist at the same time, right? And so the idea that there's sort of this ladder and you have to travel through millions of years to look at the different stages of the ladder, well, that uh, that is only really a problem if you actually think that evolution is this kind of escalator or something, mm-hmm. when in fact it just branches out in different directions. Right, so we can we can elaborate on all that when we go into the specific movies, because this is a very interesting point about uh, basically human supremacy. Which is kind of an illusion, in a way. Like, we like to tell ourselves this, but... yeah. Okay, so go on about that, and but let's let's talk about... Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. This is an illusion that we are... that the ladder... there is no ladder, but in this movie the ladder is very, very, very clear. At the beginning, at the beginning there was nothing. It's like the Bible. And then from animals that look kind of free, like they do whatever they want. And then they move up to the top of the food chain when they found a tool. I can use a stick. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but not just any tool, uh-huh. a weapon. And so there's this very famous shot that starts with the, the weapon, the bone flying through the air mm. and then cuts to a spaceship. Right. And of course the spaceships at the time of the filming of 2001, at the height of the Cold War, when the Americans and the Russians were in this space race, in the background that was, of course, all about militarizing space, right? So we cut from a very primitive weapon, the bone, to what was at the time seen as very advanced weaponry, namely spaceships. And sort of since then... Uh, the ethics have evolved a little bit and there was some sort of agreement between the Americans and the Russians not to militarize space. Although, are we really doing that? Mm. I think Trump uh, Trump has ordered uh, the establishment of a space force. Space force. Exactly, he likes yes. To say space force. Also, there are some uh, Cold War uh, uh, overtones in the movie later where there are Russians and Americans, no uh, Dutch, for example, or Brazilians or whatever. It's really interesting how you create a movie, whatever, in the future, but you can't imagine, I'm not saying that as a dig uh, to, uh, to Stanley Kubrick, this is just human. 
you can't imagine a different world order. It just has to be the same. It's the presence only more so. <laughs> right. And what I loved about this is also that there's all these brands like Pan Am in space, like Pan American and IBM yeah. and Bell Telephones. <laughs> yes. None of them really exists anymore in that <laughs> in that form. And also, like, the Russians are flying with Aeroflot, and in the logo, they have the hammer and the sickle, and all this. It's, it's wonderful. It's really a sight. Like, you can see 19, what is it, 1968 or thereabouts. Right, right, right. This is like capturing, like, a moment in time. This guy thought about the future. He did, like, a movie that is timeless, super classic, one of the top five classics all time. And still you can see like the imprint of the ink or whatever, or the tie, if you, whatever, like you cut a tree and you see how old it is. You see the sickle on a spaceship, it's just like the, the, the limits of the human imagination sometimes are really weird yeah. and arbitrary. But I want to go back a little bit about when we found the weapon. So we found the weapon, the bone, and then immediately we use it, first of all, to kill other animals. So we are better hunters and then to fight better over resources, fight off other uh, whatever apes who want resources. And then they just take it. They don't understand this uh, stick technology. It's like an, an incredible <laughs> leap. <laughs> I want to say a little bit about this assumption, uh, sort of speak to that a little bit. Like in all the movies, the general assumption is that the different hominids are aggressive towards each other and that violence is sort of for sure this motivating thing that drives us in this ascent and regression and so on and right that's probably a reasonable assumption except when we look at our actual history and the evidence that we have we don't really know why other hominids such as neanderthals or denisovans or whatever are no longer really with us and you, you might kind of want to assume well maybe we killed them or whatever yeah. Yeah. but in fact we don't really have evidence for that we do have evidence that we all fucked each other right so uh -huh. collusion <laughs> <laughs> right, so for like the, we know now from genomics that actually uh, humans and Neanderthals interbred, and that humans and Denisovans interbred. So oh. the violence is there's less evidence for that than for the sexing, hmm. which I thought was kind of an encouraging message. So thanks to this weapon, right, we get into space, but. Very early on, yeah, they show you that even though we're now superhumans flying in space, we still have to go to the bathroom and we have to take a shit. No. So we're still human, even though they walk without gravity, right? Making those weird circles. Still, they have an anus. Mm. Sorry about that. It's a god that provides like the, the leap forward every time to evolve quicker. In some way, what do you what do you think about that? That's uh... the monolith. Wow, is it God? Uh... It looks like something out of this world, and they're like worshiping it. Yeah, well, two thousand one is really hard to interpret, and um, I guess I or, interpret or easy. It... You could just whatever, whatever or, you want. Yeah, I guess my interpretation is that the uh, monoliths are kind of placed among humans uh, by some alien civilization which is not necessarily divine or anything but they just kind of think it's it would help us advance mm. yeah that can be divine like yeah like these aliens could be yeah like a, like a godly and then also classically music means civilization well, um, and it's not just any kind of uh, classical music, uh, because the uh, music in 2001 is all very, very Germanic and Teutonic. So, for example, there's, of course, once we see the um, spaceship flying, we hear the, the Blue Danube. Also blau, mm -hmm. and uh, also of course we um, hear uh, uh, Strauss. Uh, also sprach Zarathustra. <laughs> so 
So it is all very, you know, high civilization is apparently Germanic, uh, according to Stanley Kubrick. Let's uh, let's not give him a spoiler alert. What uh, what happens later? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then also, right, it's like okay, so it's like cavemen. We're afraid of the world, right? There's like a zoom in on the eyes. They're looking. They they're afraid of everything. They found a stick. Yada yada yada. Spaceships. Right. <laughs> <laughs> is this is this the way the way that it went? I I guess tool making is uh, not quite exclusively human, but it is uh, one of our important features i guess yeah this notion which is not uh, incorrect conflict and war uh, leads to progress because we make more stuff and then that stuff comes into whatever the the, the civilian world and then we all in case that we don't die and kill each other then we gain sure i mean we are talking across the internet which is of course something from DARPA, right, the, the Defense Advanced Research Project mm. Agency, and, and all of the uh, cool technologies that we have, uh, space technology, uh, radar, nuclear, uh, whatever, is, is basically all uh, originally uh, military tech. So we used that military tech, we became evolved humans, and in the spaceships, we are very polite. Everybody's very polite very nice to each other, very distant. You can't see the faces, you can't recognize the faces, you don't know who the actors are, all kinds of weird angles, contrasted to the first man where you could see his eyes, you had like a zoom in into his eyes. So as we go to space and we evolve, we become less human, maybe, more, more machine. I thought that I'm, I'm going to jump forward a little bit, that Hal was much more human than the humans who were just express, were expressionless the whole time. You can't really uh, empathize with them or uh, identify with them, uh, but you can identify with the computer as it's trying to listen in. And at the end, of course, when he's <laughs> getting killed and crying and all that, and you actually feel sorry for him, while the other guy that uh, floated out into space, fuck that guy, who cares about that guy? So, so even like the happy birthday, it's very distant, very formal. Everybody, everything is very formal, basically. Uh, and Hal is the only one who asks personal questions. He wants to know what's going on. He's being like dramatic a little bit, while the humans are like emotionless and, uh, and robotic. He's also curious, right? He has like pride and survival instincts. And I wrote to myself a note that he was sarcastic. I, I can't remember though when was he being sarcastic. Maybe when the, the guy was trying to get back into the spaceship. Also, I think it's very predictive that we see Hal beating the humans in, uh, in chess hmm? before hmm. all the chess hmm. computers. And he's like, whatever, Facebook, Google, everything in one. He reads like all the psych, the psych reports. Uh, he's creative, he's like God. Basically, we create God. He cannot make mistakes. He cannot make mistakes. While we humans, we are f like the guy that floats in space. We don't know what the hell we, we're doing. Thank God we have the manual override. <laughs> we, can, we still have something we can turn, a knob we can turn. Okay, so the computer cannot kill us all. We have a knob. We have enough. Okay. Yes, 2001 has this notion also of sort of ascending beyond humans. And how exactly that happens. Like is, is hell the thing that uh, ascends beyond humans? Or is that sort of the, the cosmic child that we see all the way in the end? But in any case, there's kind of this... Um, idea of going beyond of what we currently are... And I think it's kind of uh, relevant in that context that um, part of the music, which we mentioned earlier, is um, Also Sprach Zarathustra, which is the uh, title of the book by Nietzsche, mm. where he actually talks about the Superman and about how we're going to go into an age where we go beyond our current morality and sort of 
be free of our present constraints and become super human in some way. Why do you say the thus spoke with Zarathustra in German but not the superhuman a bit in German? It's uh, it's a bit uncomfortable to talk about Übermensch. <laughs> <laughs> ah, is it? Of course, Nietzsche is very misunderstood. <laughs> uh, <laughs> misused, misappropriated. Yes, misused, yes, yes. So, yeah, so Nietzsche talks about the Übermensch and what he means is um, a humanity that is kind of free of religion and kind of small-mindedness of the 19th century, And the Nazis took that kind of slightly differently because they thought of the Übermensch as the highest level in a kind of racial hierarchy, which is not really what Nietzsche was talking about. So so then in the movie, in 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, we evolve so much that we bring our own disaster or not. The ending is not really clear, but... The machine, the tool that gave us this evolution, later evolved into the stick, evolved into hell, and then hell can kill us. Unless we have the knob, and then the knob is again, I guess, the stick, the manual override. It actually looks like a bit like a stick now that I think about it when he turns, when he gets back into the, the spaceship through it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so let's, get, let's, let's segue to Planet of the Apes. Again, spoiler alert, it's Earth. We kind of destroy ourselves and there's another species that has overtaken us. Yeah, and um, Planet of the Apes is actually another one of those movies which is both kind of science fiction and at the same time enormously uh, a sign of its times. Okay. In many ways, we can really see the late 60s early 70s kind of era uh, of course reflected in a number of ways and um, explain a couple of them i thought i thought were was very interesting so in planet of the apes there are these also ape scientists uh, who are kind of you know liberals who think that maybe <laughs> humans could also be taught to communicate with us because the humans cannot speak yeah because in in the movie the humans cannot speak And uh, this was actually at the time when there were these very famous experiments to teach uh, chimpanzees and other apes sign language. So there's a neat sort of mirroring of that. Right. Uh, and another thing that also really reflects the times is um, that in Planet of the Apes, uh, at some point there are these uh, sort of punitive medical interventions. So some of the humans get lobotomized which is um, actually something that in another movie from about the same time we also see, namely in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where uh, Jack Nicholson's character uh, is eventually lobotomized because he is so rebellious uh, in the psychiatric institution that he's in. Wow, that was so sad. Yeah. So that, so that, that kind of, these, these two... Um, phenomena uh, actually are really reflected in Planet of the Apes. And if we go to the political realm, so that's from 1968, that's four years after the Civil Rights Act, three years after the Voting Rights Act in America, saying that uh, people with a different uh, skin complexion, complexion uh, can also uh, vote freely and cannot be, and the rights cannot be infringed. And then The, or, or, as you refer to, like the, the, the liberal doctors, it's like, no, the, I guess the humans are humans too. <laughs> the humans are apes too. Let's, uh, let's not, uh, let's everybody love everybody. Let's get along. Why can't we all just get along? And, and the reason that Charlton Heston wanted to go to space to begin with was that he was looking to find something better than humans. So he was disappointed in what he saw went to see something else and then he saw that we brought upon our destruction we cannot be trusted to run this place so this is also very deterministic right there's like you were referring uh, earlier to the ladder so there's like one progress only one path for revolution one society right either we're controlling everybody else subjugating everybody else if it's not us then the apes are going to overtake us and then they're going to subjugate us 
it's just like the, it's like every one hierarchy positions bureaucrats it's like no matter what you do no matter what time you go to this is again just like so the, to show the limits of uh, human imagination they also have uh, clerks there the the ape men at the same time though um the uh planet of the apes one uh, or you know the the original one at some points does things that i think later hollywood would be a bit more shy about so for example the really stupid apes uh in planet of the apes are kind of young earth creationists right in some way Religious, and yeah. they, they they kind of poke fun at them because they don't believe in this insidious theory called evolution <laughs> yeah, that was nice yeah i wonder how charlton heston felt about that like uh 30 years later that he made fun of uh, creationist just to finish off the point about uh, evolution so like no matter where you go you're still gonna have office politics this if you're apes or humans whatever this is <laughs> this is gonna be the, the case whichever way you go it's so, but can you explain in any scientific way how how would humans how could humans lose the ability to speak is there any similar phenomena of of a species that is losing something that it needs how could we lose that uh, because it's not something mental right or emotional for sure in uh, the, uh, evolution is not really an sort of descending to greater and greater sort of sophistication so for sure sometimes functionality is lost but maybe something that you don't need that you no longer need yeah so th- that that obviously happens but I suppose in Planet of the Apes, the original one, the thinking at the time also basically was that language is clearly something that you can just learn. And so the, hence there was also these experiments to teach apes sign language. Like the, so the idea kind of was, well, they don't really have the vocal cords that you need and the dexterity of the tongue to speak like we do with our voices, but then you could just speak with your hands. And of course, gradually, it became a bit more clear that actually there is um, kind of a hard limit to what you can teach these apes. And so what is kind of neat about this also is that one of the uh, famous scientists at the time and who is still around to uh, also talk politics and science is um, Noam Chomsky. Uh-huh, uh-huh. His original contribution to linguistics is kind of this idea that we actually do have some sort of hard-coded kind of meta-grammar or however you want to call it. Like we're kind of hardwired for language in a way that apes are not. And what is kind of neat about that is that in the sign language experiments, actually one of the apes that they tried to teach language was called not Noam Chomsky, but Nim Chimsky. Ah, <laughs> ah. But then actually, so it actually turned out that there's only so much that you can teach them. And then at some point, the, just the complexity of the sentences that they can construct just doesn't go nearly as far as we can go. So the idea at the time that sort of, well, maybe humans could lose their language just because they lost the culture, maybe through oppression or something. Right. And that uh, vice versa, apes could gain language just sort of th- culturally. Well, that is actually not quite true. It is hard coded in us, uh, uh, right? Something that apes don't have. Uh, also about, uh, we're talking about the liberal uh, ape doctors. Uh, they, all, they have British accents. So I guess that even uh, ape, apes with British accents are more sophisticated and smarter than the, the ones with American accents. The Charlton Heston character, what a horrible character, what a horrible guy, Imprison, imprisons this woman, this woman. First of all, he's racist towards the apes. Why? Why are you racist? Take your filthy paws off me. Why? What the fuck is wrong with you? And just like has like a woman, he says, I have you now. Just like owns her like a slave. What's up with that? 
So one thing, by the way, that I noticed, so uh, yeah, uh, Charlton Heston says, you know, take your stinking paws off me, you damn dirty ape. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then so in actually the reboot of uh, Planet of the Apes with uh, Marky Mm -hmm. Mark of the Funky Bunch, one of the apes says, take your stinking hands off me, you dirty human. Ah, ooh. How does that feel? Uh, It doesn't feel nice. Ah, so don't say to others. <laughs> ah, also, okay, so they are at the year 3980 AD, so that's like in a thousand years. Can evolution be so quick <laughs> to have us lose speech, apes gain speech, gain technology, be like in the Middle Ages, whatever, or early modern times in 1000 years? Clearly not. No. Ooh, plot hole! <laughs> yeah, so in the uh, later Planet of the Apes, they kind of try to address that right so there's maybe like medical experiments that are done on the apes right so they get kind of supercharged intelligence right somehow that by then they've realized well we actually have to account for this like the apes can don't suddenly become bipedal and start talking and develop all this technology within a thousand years if there's no boost anywhere then that's just not going to happen right Whatever, like four years ago, people didn't know anything about evolution. How come uh, today music executives would know that this is uh, really stupid? I suppose so, but I think that at the time there was a little bit more of an idea that there's more sort of malleability, that, you know, apes could actually learn things to the, to the same, to, to our level, so to speak. Okay, so let's go to altered states. Altered States, 1980. I have never heard of this movie before you mentioned it and told me to watch it. It is freaky. It is weird. It is unsettling. Tell the tell the listeners who have not watched it, which is 100% of them, please tell them what the movie is about. So the movie is about a scientist who is uh, sort of experimenting on himself in one of the university campuses in the U.S., And it kind of reflects the spirit of the late 60s again, where academics, uh, between quotes, experimented on themselves and each other with hallucinogenic drugs and other things. And in this case, the uh, experiments, again, they they involve drugs. They also involve uh, sensory deprivation tanks. And what that ends up doing is it kind of... um, unleashes a sort of genetic memory of previous hominid forms. And by hominids you mean like... Uh, Apes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, So one thing, uh, kind of early on in the movie, it starts actually out sort of early on that uh, the main character also goes to an uh, Indian tribe and he has this massive trip there and uh, that uh, reminds me very much also of the uh, books by uh, Carlos Castaneda, like uh, the teachings of Don Juan, which were also from about that time and from you know going to Native American tribes and doing, I guess, I think it was peyote or something like that, and just completely losing all sense of reality, but then thinking that this is actually something real and somehow being in touch with uh, these different realities. Of course, later when we found out that much of the writings of Carlos Castaneda were kind of faked. <laughs> but, uh, but so that, that's kind of the, the, the intellectual setting of the time. So this idea that expanding the mind and hallu- hallucinating, that that kind of brings out significant things. And in this and in this case, what it brings out is basically this idea that, of course, our own brains are built on top of earlier modules. Firstly, sort of earlier uh, ape men, and below that, there's these deeper layers, even of sort of the reptilian brain and so on. And then the movie gradually kind of spirals out of control, and the end is climaxes in a kind of freaky, weird way. Okay, he, beca- he, he goes through a devolution, right? He yearns to go back to a simpler time, 
because language just like people talking this is uh, just like it's uh, interfering with with our with our oneness with the nature and the world the universe and then he goes through devolution and it gets it gets freaky when he has to basically decide if he wants to stay or he wants to go yeah yeah and it's and so the movie fits in our theme for today in that there's sort of the in 2001 there's the ascent from lower to higher mm-hmm. in planet of the apes there's sort of these sideway trajectories between humans and other apes they overtook us yeah yeah but there are different side branches that sort of compete against each other and then in altered states there's sort of this regression from our level down right and like he he wants to go through that he's like very neurotic this academic neurotic that part's realistic <laughs> and he just wants to, so instead of whatever smoking a joint he goes through the, this whole experiment to just like just like stop thinking like his mind is like rushing whatever 100 kilometers per hour brrr, just like wants to wants to relax wants to relax and then he goes through science that as you alluded to earlier is like half magic half like belief mystical magic mystical science and unchecked science right he go he he's not allowed to do any of this and then a person dies because uh, because of his uh, of his science and and this yearning there are all, all these uh, buddhist overtones i think they mention uh, nirvana which is like a, a big nothing like extinguishing all our thirsts and the yearnings which is a, a positive uh, thing in uh, in, Buzi- in buddhism because our senses right they they take us away from uh, from the bare experience of bliss so this is why it goes goes into a sensory deprivation tank so just like the senses are are turned off and then it goes into darkness on the other side right then you open the door it goes from darkness into light so just like evolution and uh, and devolution but what i thought was uh, very unrealistic is that when he goes back to the ape man then he becomes super carnivorous I guess unlike humans today, which are mostly vegetarian or vegan, what uh, what the fuck was that? Just like it was accepting, I guess, that eating animals is uh, a barbaric, brutal, horrible thing that only uh, uh, whatever lesser creatures do, this ape man. But then uh, just like unrelated to the way it actually was in science, because we consume today more meat than the first men. Yes, again, what is kind of projected on our ancestors or uh, other hominids is, uh, yeah, this bloodthirst and the aggression, which is, is it true? Is it not true? Uh, I don't know. And yeah, it's, uh, I guess there is, there is a transition in our evolution where we become more hunters that is for sure the case Um, and that has also probably helped us uh, afford bigger brains because brain tissue is kind of expensive so you need very uh, high energetic content food Uh, except still you know of course right now we eat uh, on average way more meat and protein in general than we need right you can eat it every day today. Yeah, and and the idea that earlier hominids were bloodthirsty and aggressive in the way that's depicted in the movie, well, it's unknown, but it's it doesn't seem very realistic. No, but carnivorous, you you don't have like a fridge, so you can't uh, whatever keep meat to eat every day. If you run out of meat, so now you have to hunt. So it's just like it's harder than going to the supermarket. <laughs> so like so. On the one hand, like the first man or human is like pure, but on the other hand is whatever, a killer and barbaric. So that's yeah, an interesting uh, contrast. So then the freaky ending, there's like, what should he do? Should he whatever, stay with his wife and children, with his family or go back to this pure? And then the thing that wins out with all this sciencey stuff is love. Love conquers all, is transcendental. 
and like the passion for science was like the addiction, right? Like an addiction. He has to go whatever to an AA meeting or something after that. But love and support. <sighs> I don't know. Maybe I'll uh, I'll find out someday if this is true. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, uh, I really enjoyed the visual effects in this movie as well. Definitely. Like the early uh, sort of a trip scene out in the desert is, is really freaky. And then also kind of the, the, um, the creature effects where he becomes the hominid. That is fun to look at. And then later on in the movie the kind of 1980s uh, CGI, but not really CGI kind of stuff. Oh, that is fun to watch. <laughs> and that, so as a scientist, so this is again, like looking at a scientist, like he's like a, he's like an artist of some kind. It kind of reminded me in a weird way, roundabout way, like whatever to this like scientist fantasy, like Indiana Jones, like a, like a scientist hero. So as a scientist, how exciting is your life compared to this guy and Indiana Jones? From 1 to 10, Otra. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I uh, go to an office <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I stare at the screen and I talk to people <laughs> by the coffee machine. I uh, sometimes uh, go to the cafeteria or to the bathroom and uh, <laughs> that, that's about it. And sa- <laughs> and sometimes you're on TV. Well, that, that that is true. That is that is quite exciting. Ah, please tell us. Please tell us. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, as as we are recording this, it's in the same week where I was uh, filmed by uh, uh, Dutch public television for um, item that is uh, on a popular science program. Mm. So by the time you're listening to this, I am famous. <laughs> <laughs> you can't walk the streets oh, in Holland yeah, anymore. Yeah, probably not. So now I can uh, still enjoy the freedom, but uh, pretty soon, uh, yeah, it's going to be crazy. So yeah. listen to something weird that happened to me this past week. So I think the last whatever eight months or something, I have nobody approached me on the street to to say anything about the channel. There was a time, like uh, mostly during last season, season seven, Game of Thrones season seven, that I. I think I was stopped like whatever, 10, 10, 20 times. And then for whatever, a whole year or something, nothing. Just this past week, three different people uh, stopped me on the street. One Slovenian guy and two other guys. So I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe the universe is telling me, Rutger is on TV, you have to, you have to get back your fame. <laughs> you have to work on it, you have to work on it. Uh, so uh, Rutger, tie everything in. The three evolution, uh, evolution, devolution movies, evolution themes. Why are we so fascinated with 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 our ancestors, and what does our vision of them tell us about how we see ourselves? We uh, know of ourselves that there's uh, all sorts of scary sides to us that are just below the surface in aggression, wanting to oppress others, sort of sexual urges and so on. It is um, kind of convenient to project that on a slightly different species, which is sufficiently far away from us. And then in these movies, we can kind of explore that. So we have to sort of bridge the gap through space travel or through some weird sensory deprivation magic or stuff like that so that we can kind of explore our scary side and our beastly side uh, compared to, on the other hand, us kind of rising up to our humanity and maybe with some vision of what could be beyond that even. We like ourselves very much. We like ourselves, but we're also afraid of ourselves in some ways. Yes. I think all these movies kind of have below the surface, well, there's violence in us, yes. just concealed below the surface. Yes, right, right. And, and unchecked, it could des- uh, no. destroy everything that we've built, we've, heard, yeah. we've worked so hard for. Uh, okay, Rutger. Bonus movie. 
right, right, right. Yeah, but stay, stay there <laughs> after we say goodbye to all our uh, normies. Yeah, but I just I need to know that they're about to miss like the best part. I have like like a thousand jokes ready ready for this. Also, like very very uh, heartwarming, heartfelt personal stories. Oh, me too. Also, yeah. Tragic, also very tragic stories and heartwarming. You'll laugh, you'll cry. It's it, the whole range of emotions. It's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> Incredible. But uh, if you don't want to go to Patreon.com/slash God Academy and uh, get this uh, once in a lifetime experience, then I guess uh, then we'll say goodbye here. Yeah, I guess that would that kind of tells you. In which state of uh, of evolution uh, these uh, listeners are? 